Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we go to a planet of some 9 billion people by 2050, how are we going to be able to take care of all those people and provide an increased quality of life instead of just existing? There's something that's absolutely massive that's already started. It's going to go across uh, fully two continents, and actually three continents, uh, counting Africa. And it's going to bring fundamental change to the economics, to civil society development, and the environment all in one fell swoop. A gentleman here is a true expert on this particular topic, which is called the New Silk Route. It is Charles F. Seals, a good friend of mine, senior advisor to the Eurasia Center, and also the Eurasian Business Coalition, and also he's president of what's called Fed Contracting, LLC. And Charles, welcome back to the Emerald Planet. Sam, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on the show. Well, Thank we're you. always always glad to have you because uh, a man like you that's uh, everywhere in Washington, D.C., really, and was over in the Far East and, and the Central Asian Republics recently, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So tell us a little about first about the Eurasia Center and also the Eurasia Business Coalition, and then we'll get right into the new Silk Road. All right, thanks so much, Sam. Uh, the Eurasia Center and, and its uh, Eurasian Business Coalition were founded somewhat over 20 years ago, mainly by Dr. Jared Janko. And ever since then, and I've been on the board almost that long, mm -hmm. and ever since then, uh, we have uh, expanded a series of programs to focus on um, promoting and familiarizing American business uh, with, and Western business, and policymakers with the developments, especially in uh, finance, economics, infrastructure, energy, and trade from Europe all the way to Japan, and um, including all of the sea routes. And the, so, so the main focus is actionable business intelligence uh, for uh, normalizing and expanding business relations between the communities. Well, the whole thing about it that's even more interesting, though, and you left out two uh, big areas that you really focus on are higher education and somewhat K-12, but higher education specifically, and also NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And I know that uh, that's a lot of the contacts that you have because much of the research actually comes out of these research universities both here and through all those different countries on the different continents you're talking about. But there's been a lot of talk recently. People really are not that familiar in the United States, but overseas it's a, uh, it's a recurrent theme about this new silk route. And I'm gonna bring this slide up here and uh, show this very complex map. But tell us a little bit about what is it that the environmentalists, the NGOs, the businesses, higher education, uh, all these organizations, including the policymakers, you're saying, elected officials, why have they focused on this new Silk Road? It's been estimated that the infrastructure needs in Asia and from Asia to Europe require about eight trillion dollars of investment. Let's put that out there again, eight trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. And this has been referred to as what's needed for connectivity to reconnect Asia basically to itself and to the rest of the markets of the world, including, of course, Europe, which is most nearby. Uh, but the ancient Silk Road went from China to and from Europe via caravans by land and the Chinese junks and the Indian caravels and other ships by, through the Indian Ocean route. Mm -hmm. Now, the new Silk Road is taking off with that left off, and it will involve massive investment and development in roads, highways, ports and harbors on the Indian Ocean, airports, and the so-called digital Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also looking at this, you see how massive this is. You're going across two continents, and actually you're uh, tying in Africa and all this, so you really have three continents involved. Uh, the United States, uh, North America, or, you know, congenital related to that. 
but also too they're talking about uh, hospitals, uh, schools, health clinics, you know, all the basic infrastructure that, you know, actually uh, several billion people in this area because almost one third of the world's population is in this area if you look at India and, and China and all these other nations. Well, now so this is a huge investment. Remember that the, uh, the five Central Asian stands, uh, so-called stands, uh, used to be part of the Soviet Union. So all the connectivity for maybe 70 years went from Moscow to those capitals, but they weren't that much connected to each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, even now you cannot get from one stand to the next very easily by plane, uh, but this is changing. And this new Silk Route will again reconnect all of these countries in Asia and to the other markets. Now looking at here, we can uh, see these fingerlets, which is these trade routes going out. Uh, some of these are roads, others are railroads. Of course, uh, air con connectivity will be involved in this. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. What, what is the grand plan that we actually see in this map you brought for us? Well, this last August, I had the, the privilege of visiting Kazakhstan. Uh, for about two weeks. I was visiting the Future Energy Expo that that government was sponsoring and running. And Kazakhstan, and again, how many people really know this, uh, un unless it's brought right in front of you in your heads up display. But Kazakhstan, with only about 18 million people, is as big as all of Western Europe. Now, yeah. Kazakhstan is in the middle between China and Europe. Mm -hmm. And what they've been developing, for example, they, they call it the Eastern Gateway. The Eastern Gateway of Korgos, K-H-O-R-G-O-S, is going to be the world's biggest dry port. Dry port meaning like, let's say, the Dulles Airport Corridor, not on a, on a seaport, but it's the, the um, interstitch point between China and Europe. All the trains going to Europe pretty well have to go through Kazakhstan at, the, at this point. Mm -hmm. And then on its western border, it borders the Caspian Sea, and there you have ports, increased container flow, all of this, and our projections, uh, how this is going to um, magnify and extrapolate over the next 20 years. Yeah, and it's just amazing when you see the connectivity through all this going all the way from Asia, you know, literally into London. I mean, that, it's just an amazing route that's going on here. And then this really doesn't show at all because there's a northern route that's going to go up through Russia and across and then uh, through some of those old Russian uh, republics. And then uh, we'll see uh, later on, you actually have uh, trade routes uh, going from India down into Africa. So That's you right. really, I mean, it's just a huge footprint that you're, you're developing right on the globe. Well, in, 14, in the 1420s, there was an expansionist emperor in China and uh, he sent out so-called treasure fleets, six or seven, immense treasure fleets with Chinese freighters that were 10 times bigger than Columbus's ship. Mm -hmm. And they basically went through the Indian Ocean and out into the world. Then when they got back about five or six years later, there was a change of regime in China and they were mothballed. It was, you could call it the China first policy mm -hmm. instead of expanding trade routes, etc. Now uh, that era is coming back. And what we're seeing is China establishing what they call a string of pearls or 12 to 14 uh, uh, ports, mercantile ports from East Africa all the way through the Mediterranean to Tunisia. Yeah, and looking at this, uh, this is President Trump and of course this is the president of China with him as well. Tell us why is China really pushing this? And I mean, they're really pushing this. This is something they right. really want. They're investing you know, heavily in, in all of this and they've been recruiting countries all over the world to become very much involved. So tell us about the thrust and what China is all about in doing in, this. In 2013, President uh, Xi Jinping announced this plan for a new Silk Road. He called it the Belt and Road Project. Now it's called the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI. Mm -hmm. The names have changed a little bit, but that's what it's currently called. Uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or AIIB was capitalized by the Chinese government with $100 billion, $50 billion came from China and somewhat less from Russia, India and other countries. In 2016, the bank started operating in January and that bank is China's kind of flagship uh, economic development vehicle. And then in uh, this last October, the 19th Chinese Communist Party Congress 
uh, Xi Jinping uh, incorporated the Belt and Road Initiative into the Constitution of China, showing the emphasis that China has placed on this kind of outward, worldwide, and especially Asia to Europe development. Now, the whole thing about this, people were saying, well, why this uh, great expansionism at this time? So what, do you, what is the the view as far as the United States is concerned, Western Europe, as far as the intentions of China, and how do, how do all this tie together as far as U.S., Western Europe policy, and even swinging down to Australia, New Zealand, you know, these key countries that are in Asia, but yet still cut off, you know, as far as the mainland part of Asia. So what's, what's the philosophy or thinking there? Very, very good question. Very good question. There are several drivers. One driver, uh, as has been written about a lot in, in the Western press, to the extent that the press has been covering this, uh, that China has overcapacity, excess uh, manufacturing, warehousing, uh, uh, railroad capacity, and needs just like Britain did in the 17th and 18th century to expand in a kind of mercantile way. But on the other hand, this is also incredibly, I believe, my opinion is, this can only be good for the rest of the world and for Asia in particular, because they need this connectivity, they need the capital that China can now provide and is offering to provide. So, uh, it, and it isn't only China. Japan has pledged $200 billion in the so, their so-called uh, quality infrastructure initiative. Mm -hmm. And Japan has always been extremely active in aid projects and development projects. You could say that Japan and China are sort of competing in Asia all the way from uh, Indonesia to, uh, to South Asia and India in uh, building modern railways, high-speed rail, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, again, this can only be good for the countries involved. Yeah, looking at this, we're absolutely out of time. I mean, this is a massive, it's a massive project and it's a massive discussion we have to have. But uh, two things right quick. What about the other powers, uh, Russia, Pakistan, India, and uh, some of the other powers in that area? And then also, what do you see for the expansion as far as Eurasia Center, Eurasian Business Coalition? And we've got about 20 seconds to do all that. <laughs> uh, Make it quick. Uh, China has uh, uh, teamed with Pakistan uh, on offering a lot of capital, about $46 billion. Uh, it's called the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Okay. And so they're working and with Russia? them. Russia wants to expand the Trans-Siberian Railway and other projects in its Far East. Okay. So they are interested in that. Great. This is Charles F. Sills. He's a senior advisor, Eurasia Center, Eurasian Business Coalition. Thank you for being with us as we talk about the new Silk Route, its impact on the world as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. You made your house a reality. Homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. It's a short trip or a long haul. Estimated time, 47 hours. They will beg. You're hungry? I'm happy to provide. They will plead. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on a stick. stick. But whatever you do, don't wimp out. Now you're talking. Make them buckle up. He can't hurt. Remember, safety first. Cheese curls. <laughs> Second. Are you orange?
now back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, technology, services, and products. And the people, of course, are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And we have a planet that was estimated to be about 9 billion people by 2050 and maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. So how are we going to provide all the food, the fuel, the fiber, the basic infrastructure, everything that we need to enhance the quality of life and not just exist? And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me that's going to address this because there's a topic that is just really coming to the consciousness of the American public but very well known in all of Asia and much of Europe and uh, Northern Africa. This is called the New Silk Road, or One Belt, One Road concept. This is Charles F. Seals. He's a true expert in all of this, senior advisor for the Eurasia Center and the Eurasian Business Coalition, and also he's the president of what's called Fed Contracting <coughs> LLC. And Charles, welcome back to the Emerald Planet. Thank you, Sam. Great to be here. Glad to have you with us. Uh, looking at what's going on in the world as far as this uh, new silk route, or the one belt, one route concept that the Chinese have uh, developed over the past few years, and yet policymakers, governments, businesses, NGOs, environmentalists, uh, people are just now really becoming aware of this and the yes, impact right. it's going to have. But yet, you've been involved with your Fed Contracting LLC with this, really as helping people to understand what this is all about, trying to connect the U.S. with the rest of the world on this concept. So tell us a little bit about your Fed Contracting LLC, and then let's jump right into why is this one belt, one road so important? Well, as the U.S. government, and especially <coughs> U.S. government development agencies like USAID uh, become involved in Asia more and more, and especially on the New Silk Road projects, um, what we're trying to do with FED's Fed slash contracting is help small businesses, veteran-owned, woman-owned, minority-owned, hub-zone companies in America get involved uh, with the larger development architecture and engineering companies in those projects. We don't want American small business to be left behind when uh, as I mentioned earlier, there, there, there is going to be $8 trillion of investment over the next 30 to 40 years and in And that's what we Asia. can see. I think it's going to be much greater than that when you look at how massive this investment's going to be and all the different you know, countries and the continents are being directly impacted right. on this. It's just incredible. So uh, looking at all that and looking at the, the, the routes that are being developed for this, you know, you're going to have sea routes, it's going to be air, uh, roads, railroads, all of this. So you really are connecting as well as the digital highway It's going to be involved in this. So tell us a little bit about all this infrastructure as far as transportation is concerned and then how is that interlaced with the new digital highway? Well one of the, for, I mentioned before that I was in uh, uh, Astana in Kazakhstan for two weeks this last summer. One of the uh, photos that I took was at the Kazakh government um, um, pavilion uh, of, uh, it was a photo of the presentation that Kazakh Telecom State Enterprise uh, was, was showing there, and it showed traditional nomads on the steppe, but being connected and interconnected by telecom and wireless and the so-called digital Silk Road. So, Unlike what was happening when these countries were under the Soviet hegemony for 50, 60, 70 years, for example, the Soviet Union tried farming. They collectivized the steppe nomads and just pretty well destroyed their culture. They collectivized these folks into collective farms, not knowing that you can't really farm the steppe any more than you can farm the Brazilian rainforest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. And so that destroyed the economy of that entire area for decades. Now everybody's going about it in a much more res environmentally responsible way. Yeah, and looking at this scene, this is downtown Astana. What's, what's amazing about this city is just 20 years old, 20 years old, and uh, it started out, my understanding, it was like one road through this little village and 5,000 people. 
Now it's almost a million and a half people in 20 years that are settled in what we're looking at right here. So tell us, how is this really an example of what's going on in Asia that most Americans have no idea it's actually going on out there? Well, the president of Kazakhstan, uh, who has been president since its independence from, from the Soviet Union, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, has really implemented an incredible vision. He single-handedly uh, facilitated the construction of Astana as a new capital. And again, he is making Kazakhstan the linchpin between China and Europe in many ways. But he's also uh, bringing in the other countries in the region. So there's a lot of collaboration that never existed before. Yeah, and the whole thing about the collaboration, he's doing this in a way uh, not only from a policy uh, point of view, which is easy to do. You pass it through your parliament and hopefully other countries go along with you. But I mean, uh, this is really putting where uh, your money is. And of course, this was based a lot of this on hydrocarbons as far as oil and natural gas. They have many other natural resources. Uh, but yet they're going way beyond that. They want to be one of the leaders in the world as far as solar and wind energy. Well, exactly. The, the Future Energy Expo that the Kazakh government uh, ran for three months last summer was again focused on future energy. The, the great sphere, the biggest a spherical building in the world that they built as a center of the expo. They had eight levels, each level devoted to a different renewable energy, even though the money for the expo initially came from their carbon-based oil and gas uh, money that, that the Treasury had earned, but they are diversifying their economy. Yeah, Erica from Queens has called in and uh, is asking about this whole thing about why would a country that has these vast mineral resources, in other words, like oil and natural gas, and they have coal, they have everything in that country. It's the ninth largest country on the planet that most people don't even know that exists. Right. And it's just in a marvelous place. It's magnificent. But what she wants to know is, are they going to stay focused on, you know, the hydrocarbons, or are they going to really move to the renewables, or they're going to uh, put nuclear in the mix, which is being discussed. Okay, great. How's that that, that's fit a great out? question. Well, they're going to keep uh, exploiting their their Caspian Sea oil uh, uh, fields, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, solar energy prices have now dipped even below some uh, oil and gas prices for fuel for economies around the world. Mm -hmm. And Kazakhstan has incredible wind and sunlight regimes. So they're going to diversify, and that's going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs for engineers, technicians, and manufacturers in, the, in those fields alone. Well, and also agriculturalists, because we're looking at this urban uh, sky farm, and this is something that's amazing. You brought this along before we can bring that up. OK, that's the announcement about it. Uh, this is. Uh, let me, let me get over here. That's what I'm looking for right there. This is the uh, Urban Sky Farm. Now the, tell us a little bit about this. This is, this is something that's absolutely amazing. These are going to be office type buildings, skyscrapers, but instead of uh, people in offices, they're going to have multi-levels growing vegetables and fruits. And this is based not even on hydroponics, but on advanced aeroponics. It's an incredible advance in agribusiness. And what it will do, as I said, you can't farm the step efficiently. But what this will do will produce produce for the cities on the spot. Yeah, and the whole thing about this, they, they're looking at this, they want to, uh, they're going to you know, patent, trademark, do all these things, and put these around the globe so that in downtown Tokyo or downtown Washington, D.C. or downtown Rio de Janeiro, you're actually producing enough food for the people actually in that city. And yes. people think that's not possible, uh, but yet uh, many agriculturalists and also the research says, we're already producing enough food for 12 to 13 billion people already, but we're wasting half of it. So let's go back to this slide here. What is unique about this so that we were growing all of this, but at the same time, we're reducing the waste? How are they going to do this? Well, I've looked through some of the business plans. There's an American company, a couple of them actually, and a few in Italy, et cetera, that are developing these, these renderings and these, uh, uh, these plans. And the way it's done is through minimal water use. So now take these to Brazil and you're not using water. You're saving the Amazon. Yeah. And, and you're also, not using land. 
Well, the thing about these countries, we think of, uh, you know, all the water in Amazonia, we, we look around the globe, but actually the, the earth as far as potable water is drying out. That's right. I mean, That's we right. have huge, you know, massive resources of water, but it's all in the oceans. So when you're looking at this, uh, actually my understanding of this is they have ways to they're going to actually produce their own water. One is they take all the water, recycle it numerous times, but also extract the water from the air, be able to filter it and purify it, and then actually put it into the system. Right, right. I mean, it's almost like these buildings are autonomous into themselves. Fascinating technology. I tell you, this is absolutely incredible. Let me see if I can get back to this uh, other image. Tell us about what this gentleman represents and why this slide really is so important to what we're talking about. Well, he's, it's a typical image of, of a traditional um, steppe nomad uh, with his yurt or family home in the background. And again, instead of uprooting these communities, they're going to be tied together by cell phones, by wireless, by television, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the state um, telecom company is taking the lead in this. So it's a great leap forward in the right way for the rural people and connecting them in to the market economies. Okay, I'm gonna leap from this gentleman. We're going back to uh, this uh, sky uh, agriculture here. How does what he is and what he's doing relate directly to this building and the future of Kazakhstan, of the Stans, and really of the world as we go to nine billion and to 12 to 13 billion people? Well, I, I think what's important here is again bringing renewable and sustainable technologies to Central Asia mm -hmm. and, and to those countries. And here the U.S. could play a big role, and I'm going to digress a little bit because the American government, this is just my opinion, but the American government has been standoffish in not joining, along with Japan, not joining the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China has set up. But by now, there are 80 countries that are members, mm -hmm. and the U.S. and Japan are almost the only two major countries that aren't. And again, I think that Got to be quick. there has to be more and more collaboration on the part of the U.S. I will just very quickly say that there are be quick. uh, convergences and synergies between Chinese and American companies and engineering companies that could be realize. Yeah, and we got this image here as far as how we're going to protect the world from doing all of that. Uh, this is Charles F. Seals, Senior Advisor, the Eurasia Center and the Eurasian Business Coalition, President of Fed Contracting, LLC. Thank you for being with us and we talk about the new Silk Route as we create the Emerald Planet. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I guess Smokey liked that idea. <clears throat> hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation. You're resigning? Why? You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. Oh, I forgot. I'll do better. Please don't quit on me. Don't let your heart quit on you. Get your uncontrolled high blood pressure to a healthy range before it's too late. So you can't save money? Let's see easy as pie. Brown bag and lunch instead of going out. $6 save times five days a week times 10 years is 21,000 bucks. That's a lot of lettuce. Small changes today, big bucks tomorrow. Feedthepig.org. Kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs. Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terracloth cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine.
We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. The globe for what we would call the best of the best, the best practices that are real solutions that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we're looking for ways that we can actually have very practical examples and very practical ways to deal with two billion new people coming on the planet by 2050. So we're growing from seven to nine billion people just in the next couple of decades. How we're gonna be able to take care of all those people and what is the history behind all this? Because there's many ways that we can reach back to the traditional wisdom, to ancient knowledge that's been there and is available to us today. And I have someone sitting right beside me who's actually been doing that. She's a, a researcher, a specialist, a videographer, an artist, a writer, public speaker, doing all kinds of things. And uh, Lilia Deer is her name. And uh, she has her own organization called the Silk Road Art. So what we want to start off with, as most people don't know what the Silk Road is, is what is the Silk Road? And then tell us a little bit about your background as far as Silk Road art, how that fits. And then we're going to start talking about all this Marco Polo and all yeah, this yeah. Uh, interesting okay. history and your artwork. Actually, Silk Road is, is a network of uh, uh, roads uh, which branch from uh, China all the way to Europe and Africa. And uh, um, it started very long ago, uh, 130 BC. Mm -hmm under the Han Dynasty. Um, first, they developed uh, from China, and then uh, they uh, developed further, and um, mostly on those roads were sold silk uh, as an item. Um, silk was very uh, light to carry, but very uh, uh, good. Uh, uh, it was sold for very good price. Mm -hmm. And uh, many uh, royal families praised that, and even, even Cleopatra, uh, a long time ago, um, appreciated and loved uh, silk. Now looking at uh, your background, uh, I was giving this long litany, uh, you know, artist, videographer, writer, public speaker, uh, major researcher and all that, but yet you're really pulling all this together and going back to very ancient documents and I'm going to bring a couple of these uh, up here. And of course, uh, some of this is actually your artwork. So looking at that, why do we need to be reaching back to 130 BC or BCE yes. and bringing all this forward? And what's all this relevance to where we are in the 21st century? We think we're so exactly. smart. We yes. know everything. <laughs> yes. In many ways, we're only rediscovering what the ancients already knew. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, why I did research uh, about old Silk Road is uh, because it's a base for new Silk Road mm -hmm. and uh, uh, its roots are there uh, many, many centuries ago. Um, talking about, uh, well, one of the most famous travelers on the Silk Road was merchant Mar Marco Polo. Yeah, and he was and, an Italian. Yes, he was Venetian and Italian. but. Uh, I, I made research in a moment when, uh, um, in 1992, was celebrated 500 years of uh, discovery of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned that Columbus was inspired by Marco Polo's book, mm -hmm. uh, which describes um, tremendous wealth on the east, of the East, and China in particular. So um, I... Uh, um, Actually, uh, during my uh, youth, I, I traveled quite a bit, uh, quite often to, to Venice. And uh, all those impressions from my travelings to Venice and uh, reading book Marco Polo made that uh, made, uh, made me, I mean, inspired me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I made uh, uh, around 80 paintings and video about Old Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Marco Polo from uh, when I was barely babyhood inspired me as well. So I've been oh. in now 93 countries uh -huh. and I plan to get to all the rest of them. Yes. And a lot of that comes through Marco Polo. And you know, there's an old uh, story about who would be the three people that you want to have that come back in yes. existence and visit with you yes, and spend yes. the night. 
Marco Polo would be uh, one of those people because yes. uh, what he did was absolutely incredible. So you talked a little bit about the uh, Silk Road and the, the meaning of that, but it was much more than silk. And yes. there was, it was, all, they, there was yes. much they, that was happening. They, they, they sold also um, precious stones and uh, spices mm -hmm. and uh, rare wood uh, and many other items. Yeah, but that was in yeah. commerce, but uh, commerce. religion, yes. uh, tr transacted uh, of course, Christianity of, of, of and course. Mohammedism uh, and uh, Buddhism. Religion traveled also through Silk Road mm -hmm. and uh, uh, moved, for instance, from, from Europe, Christianity, uh, all the way to uh, China, then uh, Islam, uh, uh, and uh, um, also Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, along Silk Road existed many Jewish communities because they did trade and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also there were the bankers. But looking at this uh, photograph here, I mean, this is really about the spices, the teas and all that. Yes. I mean, it was so much commerce that we're enjoying today, you know, yes. in the 21st century that exactly. actually goes back to these exactly. many thousands years ago. Yes, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, existed many discoveries which, uh, which uh, uh, new things which are brought from China and then uh, from West, of course, it existed a huge exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the whole thing about all these exchanges, it really increased the quality of life, it increased the enterprise, yes. but at the same time it was doing much social good because people learned about each other yes. and then it, again cha exchanging the religions and uh, the whole notion of what humankind is all about. For instance, as a curiosity, um, um, word ciao, which we all, uh -huh. <laughs> not all use, but uh, in, in any case in Italy everybody is using that word, is a ori Chinese origin. Uh -huh. And uh, um, then uh, Venetians uh, started using and then whole, whole Italy. Mm -hmm. But um, also uh, uh, many uh, other things like, for instance, um, Chinese invented uh, paper money. And what was fascinating for me is, is that um, I saw the block from which they printed the paper money. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, printing press wasn't still invented in Europe. Yeah. I mean, and, what? And then, the yeah. Then gunpowder, for instance, also uh, compass uh, for uh, navigation um, because. Uh, uh, Europeans, uh, for instance, didn't know, um, well, geography wasn't too much developed mm -hmm. in 13th century when Marco right. Polo traveled. Uh, so Marco Polo brought knowledge from um, China and uh, Arabs also developed much more um, knowledge about geography, which we know today. Yeah, now looking at the Great Wall, this is something that uh, people think of the Great Wall, you go out and build it, it yeah. uh, really went across the whole country, but this was done over hundreds of years. It's, it was in just fact, a continuing in fact, project. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, Great Wall of China was done uh, two, two and a half, uh, two, 2,000 uh, and 200 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's incredibly old, and uh, I wanted to show the picture of Great Wall uh, so that we are reminded uh, that uh, that uh, construction, first of all, it's the lar uh, longest construction on planet, but also it's extremely old, as old as Silk Road. Well, I, and I've been on this. The whole thing about it is the complexity and the sophistication of this, because yes. you would have entire garrisons and their families living there. Yes. They produce their own food. They had access to their own water, all this. Oh, okay. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible uh, what you know goes on through this. I mean, this is like a fort that goes on for over 2,000 miles. Yes. And uh, it's absolutely incredible. But looking at uh, these images that you come up with, you superimpose yes. uh, China on Venice on, so you got this Asian uh, European mix. Why exactly. the mix? Um, well. Uh, I mean, this is beautifully done if you, understand what this is. Yes. In fact, it's uh, my figures are, uh, uh, which I did uh, in describing through visual way narration, uh, Marco Polo on the Silk Road uh, was uh, um, done. Uh, <laughs> previous to that, I, I was a non-figurative painter, and I did uh, um, um, I was inspired by corals and um, 
organic structures. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then these, these figures actually have a little bit some elements which still have those or organic structures, but it's a figurative work. And uh, um, I discovered uh, narration, uh, visual nar narration, uh, so that people can uh, follow from image to image uh, different steps mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of uh, travel. Yeah, and well, more than that is actually the progress of humankind, and I think you've uh, continued this in this uh, image here, but the, the richness of this, and then yes. going back to the essence of the silk, yes. and, and the uh, absolute beauty, longevity of this, because you can have silk fiber that lasts hundreds and thousands of exactly. years, and uh, just as if it was uh, made yesterday. And, this, and, and this, go this, ahead. This one in particular is uh, representing silk merchants. Yeah, I, I tell you, this is just absolutely incredible. Now, I wanted to bring this up. This is the book about yes. Marco Polo. That, Tell that, us about that, this. That's a book, actually, which, uh, uh, yeah, of Marco Polo, and uh, um, Mar uh, how it, uh, that came into existence. Uh, after returning from China, Marco Polo was uh, uh, purchased a ship, uh, but uh, uh, Genova, another Italian city, and uh, Venice were uh, rivals, mm -hmm. and they they been in war, at war. So um, it was a naval battle, and uh, uh, Marco Polo's ship was sunk, and he was imprisoned. And there, in prison, he was telling the stories about the Silk Road, and about. Uh, um, uh, his uh, about his uh, journey to China in general. Uh, so one of uh, the prisoners was uh, uh, Italian professional writer Rusticello da Pisa, and he uh, recorded all those tales. That's how it became a, a book of Marco Polo, which is actually in English called Book of Wonders, and in French Le Livre de Merveille. I tell you, this is absolutely fantastic. What do you see for the expansion of your work as far as Silk Road art? And you've got about 15 seconds to do that. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, for uh, the expansion of Silk Road uh, art, uh, I'm uh, going to be working uh, on much more ecological team mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's, that is the future. Yeah, I think so, absolutely. This is uh, especially, literally a Especially thing about the water. Yes, uh, Lily Adair, she's an artist, videographer, writer, public speaker, uh, has her own organization, the Silk Road Art. She is internationally famous, uh, renowned actually, <laughs> not just famous. Thank you. And thank you for being with us as we look at the new Silk Route based on the old Silk Route as we create the Emerald Planet. you bring to my company? What do you need? I need problem solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. They'll test you, try to break your will, but however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm, just wait, and move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up.
now back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technologies, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And of course, we're looking for people that are true leaders that just emerge from within societies from all over the globe. They're having a direct impact, and not only where we are today, but where we're going into the future. But some of these people are real futurists, but they're reaching back hundreds and thousands of years to find out what really was the best of the best, and how do we carry those forward into the 21st century to make a difference for 2 billion new people by 2050, and we may have 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century. And someone is that, she's an artist, a videographer, writer, public speaker, major uh, international researcher. This is uh, Lilia Deer. And the, the work you've been doing is just absolutely incredible. Thank you. And you are global, you're worldwide. Uh, you've had a chance to speak before the Library of Congress. You've spoken yes. to many prestigious conferences all over the world about the new Silk Route. But you've actually been studying and doing this for a number of years. So what, yeah. let, one, we have to introduce our viewers to what is the new Silk Route, but what was the old Silk Route and looking at this piece of artwork here, what does this really represent to the, our viewers here and abroad yes. about your research and where we're going in the future? Um, well, this particular, uh, this image is uh, showing actually uh, traveling by caravan. That was the, the way how they traveled a long time ago in, period, in the time of Marco Polo, which means 13th century. Um, caravans were by camels or horses. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, sometimes very dangerous to travel like that, um, not only because of uh, climate, going through the mountains, and uh, um, uh, some robbers were attacking mm -hmm. caravans. So um, to very important um, uh, travelers, uh, merchants, um, Emperor of China gave golden passports, which would protect them to travel through the empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, also, um, besides traveling on the, on the land uh, through the caravans, uh, uh, existed uh, also maritime route mm -hmm. uh, from China to towards India, and then uh, to Arab. Uh, um, Port of Hormuz, and later on to Alexandria, yeah. Lilia, North Africa. Looking at this uh, green line here, what does this green line tell us? And we don't really have the, the ocean or the sea routes here, but tell us a little bit about what, that, what, what we're seeing as far as the green line that, and, what is, and what is being connected. Uh, that green line uh, shows uh, one of the ro roads uh, of uh, uh, Silk Road, uh, because uh, existed a couple of branches of the Silk Road, mm -hmm. and one went through uh, from, of course, from uh, uh, China towards uh, India, and uh, um, well, after that, um, went towards the Caspian Sea and into Italy. Um, so, uh, then th there is also Northern Road, which went to uh, south of Russia, yeah. and also. Yeah, this is all very complex, and it's uh, extremely interesting. Looking at these uh, ships that we have here, what does this represent, and why was shipping so important? Even though we could normally think of the the old Silk Route was really by you know the, as you were saying the camels or horses. Yes, yes. But yet there was huge maritime trade among yes, all these was, different nations. Yes, it was a huge ma maritime trade also, and uh, um, especially because. Um, um, Sometime, especially in like fifteenth uh, um, century, um, land road was stopped by wars, uh, invasion of Turks, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkish uh, Empire actually developed, uh, so um, maritime routes then were much more important, and uh, uh, 
that is why, for instance, Columbus was looking for a faster route to China, and then he found America. But eight years after um, Columbus, um, Vasco da Gama, Portuguese uh, traveler, um, went around tip of Africa and uh, all the way to India. Yeah, yeah, and and the whole thing about this is, and now we're looking at some of the things that yeah. were developed uh, many. Uh, you the, know, hundreds, thousands of years ago that we're still using today. So yeah, this, tell us what we're looking uh, at. Uh, this, this is actually a page of a book uh, uh, of Marco Polo, uh, where emperor uh, is giving them golden passports. And this, this is a photograph of uh, a real golden passport, mm -hmm. uh, which, was, which is uh, somewhere in Siberia, I think, in one museum. Yeah. Now, the whole thing about this, I'm going to leave this up for a minute, and we have many more to look at. This is just fascinating. Uh, but the whole thing about the, the gold and, and the books, how can we, you know, hundreds of years later, why is this still preserved? I mean, what is it about humankind that we want to have keepsakes that are important to us, and yet those are really the bridge into where we are in the 21st century? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, it's very important to preserve some old uh, uh, elements from, from various cultures. And uh, for instance, uh, I would uh, mention that uh, uh, um, later on, uh, I will mention, but I can mention even now, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, a very famous musician, um, was um, organizing concerts of mm -hmm. uh, instruments from old Silk Road, and I think he was even playing Yes, oh yeah. yeah, and I've actually heard the, some of that music and I just think it's fantastic. Uh, but looking at this the, uh, image this here. This particular image is uh, one of my paintings uh, showing the tents of Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan was the emperor of China. He was actually um, he was a Mongol. Mongol origin mm -hmm. and he was a grandson of Genghis Khan. Yeah. But uh, uh, he, uh, it's, uh, it was a description in the book that uh, uh, Marco Polo met him under the tents of silk. Mm -hmm. And that really um, struck my imagination and uh, I wanted to make a painting. Well, looking at this though, I was in uh, Kazakhstan several times uh, last year and this is getting ready for you know future energy as far as the First World Expo there. And when you see the eagle and this is yes. really a symbol of so yes. many countries. And then uh, I think there's one of the photographs in here, you have the American eagle and, and to think that this yeah. is transported across time exactly. to so many uh, generations. Uh, the exchange of religions was very important because you yes. had many warring states, great bloodshed, uh, societies were actually being just totally wiped out. But all of a sudden you had uh, Buddhism, you had Islam, you had Christianity. Now was traveling back and forth across all these uh, many different yes, nations. Yes, they've been traveling. And they were bringing peace to that. Why is this uh, transporting not only of silk and spices and, and herbs and all these things, but the religions well, and the ideas of society si 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 so Silk important? Road is very important, uh, not only because of uh, trade, but also because of exchanging of the ideas. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is really one of the most important uh, uh, thing. Well, you're approach. opening up societies, no. <laughs> you're opening up Not. people to new ideas, new education, right? Yes. And uh, so what does this represent as far as Buddhism? Why, why the Buddha and not some other symbol? <laughs> well, I was uh, uh, actually uh, reading that uh, ca caravans passed uh, big statues of Buddha, which were uh, on the side of the mountains. Uh, especially in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and uh, then and further Bamiyan. also in Bamiyan mm -hmm. and so on. Of course, uh, Bamiyan, uh, uh, Buddha Bamiyan was destroyed later on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, that's well, by the, the Taliban, yeah, so yeah. that's, that's Th yeah. you know, it lasted almost a thousand actually, years. Actually, which, uh, what they didn't know that uh, Afghanistan was, uh, uh, that was their heritage uh, because they've been Buddhist before as a nation. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, switched to Islam. And then of course they, yeah, destroyed those. Yeah, looking at this though, okay, tell us a little bit about this. We're going through these because the, the, I think these, these are very important yeah. as far as the cultures uh, and the, the, the ideas. Uh, these are some, uh, some of the paintings actually, Marco Polo uh, meeting with Emperor of China. And uh, uh, you know, bamboo garden and so on. So um, 
that is like one of my inspirations. Yeah, but also the silk. You know, you yes. look at the richness, yes. the textures yes, I, just come yeah, through I was, and it's I was very trying, vivid. Yes, I was trying to uh, give the impression of, uh, of those uh, special uh, silk uh, fabrics. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually uh, representing the bridge which was built uh, way after Marco Polo. But uh, I wanted to present one of the um, architectural uh, constructions uh, typical for China. And this bridge is uh, in uh, Summer Palace in Beijing. Yeah, but it's really important, the techniques, and we talk about knowledge and religion and all that, but just the engineering uh, and the many other techniques that were, yes. you know, traded back and forth. Yes. And you can see that when you look at the great cathedrals of Europe, you can see some, you know, Chinese exactly. design and influence. Yes. And then you look and at some of the things yes, exactly. in China are influenced from the West. I mean, it's just fascinating to um, have all that. And this goes back to uh, and this, the Yeah, paper this money. is about paper money and uh, uh, the... Before Gutenberg. Yes, before... Uh, Good man. Yeah, the uh, the printing press. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, is a TO map, so-called TO map, and uh, uh, up to 13th century Europeans were using this map uh, to navigate or to travel. Uh, as you see, that is very uh, rudimentary, a very simplified map, mm -hmm. and uh, it's showing uh, Asia, uh, Africa, and Europe, uh, just like by name, mm -hmm. and in the Middle East, Jerusalem is the center of the, of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, later on, Marco Polo brought knowledge about geography. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to point out that- uh, well, we're, got, we're running absolutely yeah. out of time, and uh, I'm gonna just leave this one up because this is a similarity between the Chinese and Venice. But yes. what do you see for the expansion of all this work that you're doing for the world? You've got about yes. 20 seconds. You gotta be quick. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, uh, after uh, this cycle about uh, old uh, uh, road, I would like to consecrate my, se my work to the uh, new ecology and especially to the theme of water. That's fantastic. Thank you for being Thank here. You. This is absolutely wonderful having you here. And uh, look at all these Thank you for uh, inviting images me. that you have. And it's absolutely incredible. So Lilia Deer, artist, videographer, uh, writer, public speaker at Silk Road Art, thank you for being with us. Thank you, dear viewers, for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet.